long enough, um, you know, this state has some very unpredictable weather, right? I mean, earlier this week, we were getting ready for spring, and then Friday rolls around, and all of a sudden, sirens are going off in some of our cities, and you look out the window, and there's hail coming out, and this morning, half of us are in winter clothes again, and it's April, um, and it doesn't make no sense. Um, some of these storms that come, that um, when tornadoes or sirens of hail cause a lot of damage, they cause a lot of destruction. Um, a couple of years ago, our house was hit with, um, with hail in Wiley, and our property alone had almost $30,000 worth of damage, and it took a while to fix because the entire city was destroyed. Tornadoes, hail, hurricanes, dangerous, they're expensive. And it's not just the loss of property that's bad, it's the reality that in a lot of these storms, it also means loss of life. Um, and what's really sad is in these storms, there are warnings that are given about the risk of not finding a safe place to stay, and yet how many people ignore these warnings. I remember when I was in Tulsa um, at school, there was one night, we were living in the apartments, and um, the tornado sirens go off, and it was like one in the morning, me and my roommates were like some of the few people in our apartment community that were awake, and so we ran out of the apartments, and we were trying to gather people and trying to get to um, a Marriott hotel that was about a mile away from where we lived, and trying to get everyone into a bunker there, and there was this one drunk guy he was laughing at us. He was like, nothing's going to happen. Um, and he was standing in the rain, getting soaked, and would not heed the warning. So we just finally had to say, you know what? It's his choice. If he wants to die, he could die. We're leaving. Um, uh, fortunately, by God's grace, he didn't die. Um, and there wasn't a lot of damage. But warning signs that says, hey, be careful. And yet you refuse. I'm thinking about even Houston last year, a number of people that were stranded in their homes because they wouldn't listen to warnings. A story that took place back in 1969 was the story of the Hurricane Camille that hit um, southern Mississippi. And a certain set of apartments on that coast, a group of 24 refused to leave because they didn't want to get out, even though they were warned over and over. And a cop even came to them, knocked on their doors and said, hey, I will escort you out. I'll get you to safety. And they're like, no, it's okay. We're going to throw a hurricane party here in the middle of the storm. Camille was the second largest hurricane ever to hit the U.S. Wind gusts, gusts of 200 miles an hour, a storm surge of over 24 feet, and only one out of the 24 survived. You've got to ask the question, why didn't they heed the warning? Why didn't they listen when they were being told that danger was coming? Why didn't they believe the cop that risked his life so that he could try to escort them out to safety. And yet as strange as unbelief, that unbelief may sound, what's even more startling is the unbelief of the people in Jesus' time when they came to Jesus. I mean, Jesus had grown up among these guys, and yet he never sinned. Can you imagine having Jesus as a friend? I mean, he's the guy that always picks up the tap. He's the guy that always opens the doors for the ladies. He's the guy that always uses his turn signal. He always lets you merge in front of him. That's Jesus. And Jesus grew up with these guys. He was never mean. He was never jealous. He never was bitter. He was never insincere. He never stole from people. He never teased people. He never lied to people. He never provoked people. He was always kind. He was generous. He was gracious. He was the kid that your mom would say, why can't you be like Jesus? That was Jesus, right? Um, he looked out for the poor. He looked out for the marginalized. He socialized with outcasts that no one else wanted anything to do with. And if you viewed a montage of Jesus' life, you would see a happily newlywed couple rejoicing because Jesus came in and turned water into wine so that their celebration could continue. You could see 15,000 men and women who had enjoyed some fish and chips because Jesus took five pieces of bread and two pieces of fish and multiplied it so that they all left completely full. You could see a band of disciples who were relieved because they made it through a horrible storm that Jesus caused to stop with just a snap of his finger, with just a word from his mouth. You could see a woman from Samaria, along with people from her village, 
that had been reached by the love of Jesus and their lives were completely changed. You see one of Herod's servants, a soldier, holding his son with joy because Jesus had healed him. You'd see a man grinning from year to year, bouncing along a path who had been homeless and paralyzed for 38 years, but Jesus had restored his feet. You'd see a man, sh a woman shining with joy because in a, f a few moments ago, she was the target of religious leaders who were trying to stone her, but Jesus had saved her from this group of vigilantes. You see a young man with eyes wide open, staring at everything like a kid that had just gone to Disneyland because Jesus had opened his eyes and he could see for the first time. You see a brother with his arm around his two sisters laughing together because Jesus brought him back from the dead with just a simple word. And that's just the Gospel of John. Those are just the stories we've covered so far in the first 12 chapters, not to mention the hundreds of other events in the other Gospels that Jesus has done. People would lying, would form a line that would go miles and miles long and testify of the things that Jesus had done in their lives, people that Jesus had healed, demons that had been cast out, hope of salvation and forgiveness, and many more he lifted up from the ash heaps of the world. The evidence that Jesus was who he said he was, that he was God, is overwhelming. And yet, despite all of this evidence, despite the warnings, despite Jesus wooing these people in, the people stare at Jesus like he's a vegetarian at a barbecue pit. They don't know what to do with Jesus. Or they're just downright sick of Jesus. Why don't people believe in Jesus. Clearly, it isn't an intellectual problem, for the evidence was there. He was doing things that only God could do. Well, let's bring this a little bit closer to home. Why don't you and I believe in Jesus? Or, let's flip it around, why do we believe in Jesus? Why do we believe in Jesus? Is it a psychological issue? that we are codependent and codependent people need Jesus? Is it a social or a cultural issue that we're in Texas, everyone in Texas believes in Jesus, right? Or is it a political issue that I belong to this party and therefore I love Jesus? Or is it a spiritual issue? Is it a desperate need knowing that you are destroying your life on your own? And in our passage this morning, we're gonna discover Four reasons why the crowds refuse Jesus. Four reasons why Jesus is rejected. And four reasons why Jesus is still rejected today. And they offer a glimpse into our own hearts and into the hearts of the people around us, into the pe hearts of the people that we are trying to love and embrace and point toward Jesus. So we're going to look at this as we study this passage, John 12. We're going to go from verse 36 to the end of the passage. First thing we want to notice, one of the reasons why the main reason why people reject Jesus is the depravity of man. So we're deprived. In verse 36, when Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. And though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. Verse 36, the beginning of that verse, if you look in your Bibles, it says that Jesus told them that he was the light of the world. And that this light was about to be snuffed out. In the New, New Living Translation, it says, put your trust in the light while there's still time. Jesus encourages them, saying, hey, trust me. When it's snuffed out, there is nothing but darkness remaining. So they needed to be urgent about their decision to follow him. But notice, they didn't come to him. And so Jesus hides himself from them. Jesus now, not only literally, but symbolically, walks away from them. He hides you say, what's up with that? Why would Jesus hide from people? I thought Jesus doesn't play hide and seek. I thought he's too big for that, right? This doesn't sound very loving. This doesn't sound very kind. Why would Jesus hide from these people? My friends, Jesus has been revealing himself to this group of people for 33 years. And for the first time, he hides himself from them. The only other time he hid from them was when they were trying to kill him. And he hid so he could get away. But he kept coming back. Remember our story when they were trying to stone him? They tried to stone him, and the next day, he's right back 
at that same place. Jesus, as we've talked about earlier, is relentless in his pursuit of us. He wants us. He pursues us. I'm so glad I'm not Jesus and you're not Jesus because if I was Jesus, I would have been done with people a long time ago. I would have looked at the heavens and I would have said, Father, be me up because these people do not want to listen and I'm done with them. But Jesus, he kept coming back. He keeps doing miracles. He keeps healing people that would ultimately reject him. He keeps serving people that ultimately would yell, crucify him. And he keeps revealing his glory to people. And the Gospels, in between Matthew and John, they record 36 miracles that Jesus did. But we know that's not all that Jesus did. In John 21, it says, Now, the, now there are many other things that Jesus did, where every one of them written... I suppose the world itself could not contain the book, contain the books that could have been written. He did so much. It wasn't that they didn't have the opportunity to believe. Rather, they continually rejected Jesus. Honestly, their unbelief was the greatest miracle. It was unfathomable. Jesus told them in John, 13, John 10 to believe the signs, but they just wouldn't. They refused to believe. My son did this to me a few weeks ago. I was telling him to clean um, the game room, and he puts his hands in his ears, and he goes, la, 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 I can't hear you. And that's what these guys are like. Jesus is like, believe in me, la, 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 I can't hear you, I don't want you. That's what th th these people were like in front of Jesus. Why did they do this? Why were they so juvenile? Why were they acting like my four-year-old? Verse 38. So that the words spoken by the prophet Isaiah may be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? So here's John giving us a glimpse into Isaiah 53. Why didn't they believe? Wasn't there not enough proof? What more could have been done? See, the problem wasn't with Jesus. He was showing them that he was God. Was it simply because they, in their own power or free will, decided that they didn't want Jesus? Yes and no. They did reject Jesus. Verse 37 shows human culpability, but they also were unable to come to Jesus. And beyond that, they didn't want to come to Jesus. They saw the signs, but the signs didn't mean anything to them. It didn't catch their attention. Some years ago, there was a massive car pileup in a dense fog on a bridge just outside of London. And though the hazard lights were on, they couldn't see the oncoming traffic. Ten people had already been killed in the car pileup when two policemen arrived on the scene. And when they saw the horrendous accident, they ran back up the roadway trying to get some distance to stop oncoming traffic. They waved their arms. They shouted at the top of their lungs. But most drivers took no notice. One policeman picked up traffic cones and began to fling them at car windows in desperate attempt to warn drivers of the danger ahead. One officer told how he had tears coming down, how he saw tears coming down his partner's face as he flung cones. But car after car went by unresponsive as he awaited the sickening sound of another crash of the growing mass of wreckage building up on the bridge. My friends, Jesus with tears had been flinging cones at these people over and over and yet they refused to see him. They don't see him and the truth is they didn't want to see him. They were so consumed with themselves that they missed Jesus. John 6 says that no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Psalm 14 The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there's any who understand any who seek after God, they've all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Romans 3, as it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. No one seeks God. Isaiah 53, we all, like sheep, have gone astray, all of us. We've turned everyone to our own way, and the Lord has laid on Jesus the iniquity of us all. You know, left to ourselves, you and I, we would go on this path toward hell, and we wouldn't care. 
We would be full of joy and laughing and enjoying life, and we would wake up one day in hell and realize that we missed it. We drive onto the bridge to our death. You'd say, that doesn't sound good. You're like, wait a minute, don't I have a free will to choose? Can I not choose what I want? And you're right, you do have a free will to choose. You can choose the sin all you want. You can choose to do whatever sin you want. And some of us will do more sin than the others of us. But none of us is free to come to God on our own. None of us wake up by ourselves and say, today I'm going to pursue God. We don't want to. We're free to choose our master, but we're not free to choose our freedom. Apart from Jesus, Scripture says that we are slaves to sin, meaning you are bound to the realm of sin. Sure, you can do some good. Sure, you can live a moral life. Sure, you can do some charitable deeds, but you cannot come to Jesus on your own. You never will. Paul writes in the book of Colossians, he says, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness, and he transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. Domain is the area of freedom that we have. We are free in the realm of darkness. We can do all we want in that realm of darkness, but to get out of darkness and be transferred into light, we can't just walk out of one thing and go into the other. We have to be transferred. We have to be transplanted. We have to have someone rescue us. You and I, we were bound to sin, and we would have stayed bound to sin if it wasn't for Jesus. If it wasn't for his Holy Spirit drawing us in, we never would have came. And you say, wait, I don't like that. And there's a reason when we come to passages like this in Scripture that we try to rush over it or we get quiet over it because it's an attack on our self-exaltation. It's an attack on what we can do. And listen, self-exaltation makes love for Jesus impossible. See, unless we feel the power and the pervasiveness and the eternal peril of the bondage of our will, we will not savor and see, see or sing of the glory of God's sovereign grace in our lives. This doctrine is the black velvet backdrop to the diamond of God's grace. John Piper would say it this way, God's grace will not be glorified as it ought to be until the church with deep understanding and exploding joy says from its heart, for from him and through him and to him are all things, including my faith and my obedience to him be glory forever. Listen, we're all stuck in this hole of sin, and we're free to run around in it. We're free to dig into it, but we're only digging ourselves deeper. But we don't have the freedom to climb out of it. We've got to be transplanted. This is what in theology we call total depravity or pervasive depravity or total inability. There is no way you and I, if it wasn't for Jesus, would ever have a heart or desire for God. Listen, if you are a follower of Jesus in this room today, it wasn't because of what you did, but God in his grace and mercy drew you to him. There is nothing that you and I could boast of. It is purely his kindness and mercy in our lives. Psalms 40 says, he lifted me up out of the miry clay or the slimy pit. He put me, took me out of the mud and mire. He set me on a rock. He gave me a firm place to stand. What did I do? I just let him do all that stuff for me. I didn't do anything. It is purely God's grace that we're saved. Number one, people, the reason why people don't come to God is they're depraved. Number two is the hardening of God. The hardening of God. Verse 39, therefore they could not believe. And for again, Isaiah said, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Now John takes us again back all the way to the prophet Isaiah. And he goes to Isaiah 6 where Isaiah is commissioned for ministry. And it's a very interesting statement. For Jesus, for God would tell Isaiah to go 
and tell the people about him. But Isaiah would realize that it was going to be a very unfruitful trip, that people would reject him. He says, go, Isaiah, tell my people, and know that as you're going, people are going to ignore you. Know that as, people are, as you're going and telling them about me, people are going to reject you. Be br- they're go- you're going to be the brunt of jokes. People are going to mock you. People are going to ridicule you. People are going to laugh at you. But I want you to go anyway. And this is exactly what happens to Jesus. The reason they don't see Jesus is because they're blinded not just by sin, but by Jesus himself. Jesus quotes this passage again in Matthew 13, and Paul quotes this passage in Acts 28. And this is something that we, you and I have to wrestle with. Remember, Jesus has been speaking to a people who have heard and seen everything there is to see about Jesus, and they reject him over and over and over again. The cones have hit their proverbial windshields, and yet they still drive into destruction. It is only after their rejection that he begins to harden their hearts like he did with Pharaoh in Egypt. Look at this passage in Matthew 13. He says, The disciples came to him and said, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing that they do not see, and hearing that they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's hearts have grown dull, and their ears can barely hear, and their eyes have been closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with, with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. The point is that if anyone uses the spiritual truth that he has, that truth grows. More is added to it. But by contrast, if he doesn't use it, he finds that it vanishes little by little. If we fail to exercise a muscle, one day that muscle will become useless. If we fail to use our intellectual powers, the time will come that we will not be able to remember those things that we've learned. Use it or use it. Use it or lose it is the principle. And when it comes to our response to the gospel, We have to realize that if we do not respond time and time again, when it's offered to us, eventually we'll become immune to it. And like Pharaoh in Egypt, his heart becomes hardened. It's like being around the gospel enough, just enough to be vaccinated by it. A vaccination immunizes by giving just a very mild dose of the disease. A person who has been exposed to the gospel can just get enough to immunize them to it from the real thing. And the longer you continue to resist, whether graciously or violently, the more you become immune to it. The spiritual system becomes more and more unresponsive and insensitive to the gospel. Some of you in this room are saying, you know, I have time later to make a decision about God. But the more you hear it, the more your heart becomes hardened if you don't respond. My friends, the gospel is not something to be played around with. The gospel is not something you mess around with. And Jesus, my friends, is not someone for you to just admire. Jesus isn't someone for you just to contemplate on. Jesus is someone you have to respond to. You've got to respond to him. In 1984, an airline crashed just outside of Spain. An investigator studying the accident made an eerie discovery. The black box in the plane revealed that several minutes before the impact of the plane, before the plane crashed, there was a voice from the plane's automatic warning system that yelled to the crew in English, pull up, pull up. But the crew ignored him, thinking that the system had gone, had malfunctioned. He said it to shut up, and he turns off the system. And minutes later, the plane 
flows right into the top of a mountain, and everyone on board dies. See, this is what sin does. This is what continued rejection of Jesus does. Eventually, it makes your heart so hard that the warning signals of God are suppressed, and eventually you don't hear it. You start to say inside your mind, oh, shut up, Holy Spirit. I don't want to hear you right now. I don't want to listen to you right now. And you become comfortable in your rejection of God, and eventually you don't see any value in Him. And you, and you and I know that, right? Because there's sins that we do that the first time we do it, we feel convicted. But we didn't get caught, and so we keep doing it. And eventually it gets to that point that it doesn't even bother us anymore because we become insensitive toward it, because we don't hear the warning signs anymore. Kierkegaard was a Danish philosopher, and he tells a story of a duck that's flying in the springtime over Europe. And during the flight, he came into a Danish barnyard, and there were these ducks in the barnyard. And he enjoyed, he flew down and he enjoyed some of their corn, and he stayed with them for an hour, and then, then he stayed with them for a day, and then he stayed with them for a week, and then it became a month. And finally, because he relished the food and the company of the ducks and the safety of the barnyard, he stayed there all summer. And yet one autumn day, when the flock of wild ducks were flying over south, southward again, they passed over the barnyard, and their mate heard their cries. And he was stirred with the strange thrill of joy and excitement. And with great flapping of wings, he tried to rise to the air to meet his friends. But he found that the food that he eaten had made him so soft and heavy that he couldn't rise no higher than the top of the barn. And so he dropped back again to the barnyard and said, Oh, well, at least I'm safe here. At least I have food here. At least I'm comfortable here. And every spring and every autumn, when he heard the wild ducks honking, his eyes would look up for a moment, and then he would begin to flap his wings. But finally the day came when the wild ducks flew over him, and they uttered their cry and he didn't even notice. He didn't even pay attention. My friends, the sun that melts the wax is the same sun that hardens the clay. The gospel is not something that you and I play around with. We have to respond with it, respond to it. And so Jesus lets them go on their own. Jesus is not a cruel dictator who prepares people for hell. It was made for the devil and his demons. He's a loving God that warns and warns and proclaims and woos and tells people about the glory of heaven, that if they would just come to Jesus, what would happen to them? And then he warns them of what will happen if they don't. Therefore, those who are continually not willing to repent will not eventually be able to repent at a certain point because they become insensitive. He told them to come to the light while they still had light, but because they wouldn't believe, now they could not believe. God doesn't have to blind anyone. We've already been blinded by ourselves and by Satan. We don't want to come to the light. You see, the question isn't, why doesn't God save everyone? The question is, why does God save anyone at all? Why does God save us? We don't deserve it. Why does he save us? But we have to be careful because there comes a point of no return when it comes to rejecting Jesus. There comes a point where you've sat here long enough and heard this message long enough that it doesn't convict you anymore. And that's a dangerous place to be. We don't know what that point is for each of our lives, but there comes a time when Jesus basically says, you know, you're on your own. And that's not a good place to be. And this is why in Scripture, over and over, we have warnings like in Psalm 95 that says, Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Hebrews, numerous times in Hebrews, Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Think about all that they had seen of Jesus, all the evidence that Jesus had put forward, all the love that he has shown these people, and yet they still would not believe him, meaning they didn't want him, treasure him, or prefer him above their own lives and religion. Again, it's a miracle that any one of us are followers of Jesus. We haven't seen the half of what these people saw, and yet we believe. Why? 
It's not because of us. It's simply because of his grace. It's simply because of his grace. Number three. Third reason why people reject Jesus as the lure of the world. Verse 42. Nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, believed in him. But they, for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it. So they would not be put out of the synagogues. For they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. The first thing we had to figure out in this text is, was their faith genuine? Or was this just a, an emotional response? If you've been with us, we've seen throughout the Gospel of John that Jesus notes people, and he mentions people who believed in Jesus, but they didn't really believe. They just loved the things that Jesus did. They just wanted what Jesus would give them. They wanted a better life, but they didn't want Jesus. They just wanted power and influence for their own selfish ends. But they didn't really want Jesus for the sake of Jesus, and thus they don't obey him. And this is the, probably the category that these people fit in John 12. Listen, for the gospel to truly set in, you have to see Jesus as Savior, Lord, and treasure. You know he died for you, that you want to follow him, and he is what you desire above everything else in life, knowledge, assent, and trust. The reformers broke faith into three components, knowledge, assent, trust. Admit, believe, and commit. And commit. This is true saving faith. Admitting, believing, and convict and committing. In the 19th century, there was a great tightrope tight walker in the world named Charles Blondin. On June 30th, 19, 1859, he became the first man in history to walk on a tightrope across Niagara Falls in Canada. Over 25,000 people gathered to watch him walk 1,100 feet suspended on a tiny rope 160 feet above the raging waters. He worked without a net or a safety harness of any kind. The slightest slip would have been proven faithful. In the days that followed, he would walk across the fall many, many times. Once he walked across on stilts. Once he carried his manager across his back, piggyback, and carried him across the Niagara Falls. Once he pushed a wheelbarrow loaded with 350 pounds of cement. On another occasion, he looked at the crowd of the cheering spectators, and he asked if he thought that any, he thought he asked if they thought that he could carry someone sitting in the wheelbarrow, carry them across. And they all yelled and said, of course you can, of course you can. And he looked at one guy and he said, sir, do you think I could safely carry you across the wheelbarrow? And he said, absolutely. And he said, all right, get in. And the guy was like, no, thank you. The man refused. See, that's true saving faith. It's one thing to believe a man can walk across by himself. It's another thing to believe that he can safely carry you across. But it is a totally different thing to get in that wheelbarrow and let him carry you across. It's not enough for us to believe that Jesus theoretically could save us until you and I get in that wheelbarrow and trust all of ourselves to him. We're not saved. This is the difference between true saving faith and the crowds that weren't willing to get in the wheelbarrow that Jesus was pushing. So what kept these guys from following Jesus? What kept these guys from believing in Jesus practically? They admitted who he was. They believed in him. They assented to the facts that he was God, but they wouldn't commit their lives to Jesus and follow him. They wouldn't get in the wheelbarrow. What kept them from trusting Jesus? It was the lure of the world. They were more concerned what other people thought. They valued their comfort, their safety, their applause, their accolades more than Jesus. They loved the glory of man more than the glory of God. Friends, following Jesus is hard. It's not come to Jesus and I'm just going to make your life happy and you're going to walk through a garden with roses every single day. Matter of fact, matter of fact following Jesus is impossible. We are so bent toward wanting the world's approval and we're so bent by the fear of disappointing people or being shamed by people that we want nothing but their approval. We need grace to be released from that bondage. 
You see, being put out of the synagogue in those days meant losing everything. Your family would disown you. You would lose your job. You would lose your social standing and culture. You could lose your home, and you could end up in poverty with no hope of ever returning to any status in society. That was a big deal to follow Jesus. You say, well, wait a minute. Can I not be afraid? Can I not, can I not have worries or doubts or concerns? Can a believer not be silent about his or her faith? Yeah, you can be afraid. But this is why you and I have to continually go back to the cross where we were saved. The root of fear, the root cause of fear is idolatry. It's fear of other people. You've, this is why we stay away from the cross, because we find value and worth in someone or something else's opinion, and we're afraid of disappointing or losing it. But you cannot be a secret believer. Listen, God doesn't have secret spies in his family. There isn't any. In John 9, we studied this. A man gets kicked out of the synagogue for pursuing Jesus. Complete contrast to these guys here. This is why I love baptisms. We did a baptism here last week. Baptism doesn't save anyone. It doesn't wash away sin. Water is about as helpful in washing away sin as gasoline is in putting out a fire. But baptism is an opportunity to stand publicly and identify with Jesus and his followers. You know, there's parts of the world where you can accept Jesus as a Savior. They don't care. It's not a problem. But the moment you publicly profess in baptism saying, I reject every other God and I'm publicly declaring that Jesus is my only God, that's a moment they're about to lose everything. We have the joy of getting baptized, not worrying about that. But there's parts of the world where baptism means you're going to lose everything. And so those of you who were baptized last week, you get to stand among those people and saying, I too profess publicly that Jesus is my only Lord, my only Savior. And I too stand with brothers and sisters who have given up their lives for Jesus. And I publicly declare alongside of them that Jesus is everything, that Jesus is my treasure. Listen, the Bible knows nothing about an unbaptized believer because there were no secret agent Christians in the Bible. Where are you at? Do you believe in Jesus? Do you follow him? Do you want him above everything else? And the gospel has to set in and it has to do something in your heart. God has to draw you to himself. All right, last thing. Last reason why people reject Jesus is the love of self. Is the love of self. Verse 44 through verse 50 is a summary of everything Jesus taught in his public ministry over the last three years. Verse 44, Jesus cries out, Whoever believes in me believes not in me, but the one, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me sees him who sent me. He's saying, He's God. If you see Jesus, you see God. Seeing Jesus is seeing God face to face. Verse 46. I've come into the world as a light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I don't judge them. For I didn't come to judge the world, but to save them. And here Jesus explains his mission. He came on a rescue mission to seek and save the lost. His work was restoration, not condemnation. But like Noah's flood, the earth is filling up and the rains are about to fall. And if you don't get on board, judgment will swallow you up very soon. Verse 48. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on that last day. For I have not spoken of my own authority, but the Father who sent me has given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. The bottom line is if these people have rejected Jesus, these people have rejected Jesus and chosen something else. They desired their own plans and their own choices. They have in effect said, like Ernest Henley, I am the master of my life. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. And in the end, Jesus will give them exactly what they want. He'll give them themselves. In C.S. Lewis's book, The Great Divorce, he describes a busload of people from hell who get an opportunity to visit heaven. And they're urged to leave behind the sins that have trapped them in hell, but they refuse. 
They want their freedom, which means they just want themselves. And C.S. Lewis makes this statement. He says, there are only two kinds of people. Those who say, thy will be done to God, and those to whom God will say in the end, thy will be done. All that are in hell choose, it, choose to do their own will. Verse 15, I know that his commandment is eternal life. And what I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. Jesus has been given a mission by the Father, a commandment by the Father. And that commandment is not something you do. It is something you possess, eternal life. How do you obey eternal life? You can't. And that's the beauty of it. We sit in our sin, both unwilling and uninterested to move. We're stuck in a pit by using our own free will to dig deeper and deeper until we reach hell itself. We're running hard and fast away from God, from God and we want everything the world has to offer us, all of its accolades, all of its approvals and possessions and lusts. And ultimately, we, like a kid upset with his parents, we just want to close the door and be left alone. And we've closed the door on eternal life because we've closed the door on Jesus. We can't obey to get eternal life, but Jesus can do that for us. And that's exactly what Jesus does. Despite our rejection, despite the hardness of our heart, despite our love for ourselves, despite our love for self-glorification, Jesus obeys the Father's commands and goes to the cross and goes into the grave and comes out on the other side. And as a result of that, he offers you and I eternal life through him. The commandment to be obeyed this morning is believe. Believe. Get in the wheelbarrow and trust that Jesus will get you to the other side. You say, but I have many doubts. You say, but I have many, many questions. My faith is weak. It's not strong. Listen, it's not about how strong your faith is. It's about how strong your Savior is. It's not about how strong your faith is. It's about how strong your Savior is. You've heard me use this illustration before from Tim Keller. Tim Keller says, imagine you're on a high cliff and you lose your footing and you begin to fall. And just as you fall beside you is a branch sticking out of the, gra <coughs> sticking out of the very edge of the cliff. It is your only hope and it's more than strong enough to support you and your weight. How can it save you? If your mind is filled with intellectual certainty that the branch cannot support you and you don't actually reach out and grab it, you're lost. If your mind is instead filled with doubt and uncertainty that the branch can hold you, but you still reach out and you grab it, you're saved. Why? Because it's not the strength of your faith. It's the object of your faith that saves you. It's not the strength of your faith. It's the object of your faith. Strong faith in a weak branch is fatally inferior to weak faith in a strong branch. Listen, Jesus is a branch that will not break. It doesn't matter how weak your faith is, his, Jesus is strong. Jesus is strong enough to hold all of your doubts, all of your questions, all of your worries. And can I invite you this morning, whether you've been a follower of Jesus forever, or if this is brand new to you, reach out and hold the branch of Jesus. And if you already reach for their branch and you are a Christian this morning, then reflect on this passage and be amazed by the grace of God in your life. What do you have to boast this morning but Jesus? But Jesus. Jesus, God, has lifted us out of the miry clay. He set us on a rock to stay. Remember your chains. Think about what your life would have been if Jesus hadn't encountered you. He didn't ambush you if he didn't ambush you with his grace. Oh, the grace of Jesus. Amazing grace that saved a wretch like me.